Hey, it's Darius. And as the number one CPA exam tutor and host of the I-75 CPA review course, don't you think students hit me up and say, hey, Darius, what is the most likely topic for a simulation in audit? So I thought I would respond with a little YouTube mini series on CPA audit exam best bet simulations. And my number one topic, adjusting journal entries. And I know what you're thinking, why journal entries for the audit exam? Don't they give you that on the FAR exam? Well, sure. So why are they testing debits and credits on the audit exam? Here's the reason. Because the auditor needs to know what entries should have been made during the year, especially at year end, in order to look for error or fraud in particular areas, including overstatement of revenue, which is a huge fraud area. How are you going to give an opinion as to fair presentation of financial statements if you as an auditor don't know what fair presentation is supposed to look like? So as an auditor, you need to know what journal entries should have been made. And I don't think there's anything more important than that. Understanding what entries should have been made, because if you see entries that were made that shouldn't have been made, then you've got to propose corrections. And if you know of journal entries that should have been made but weren't, then again, you have to propose corrections. So adjusting and correcting entries, why wouldn't they ask you that on the audit exam? Now, as far as adjusting entries go, the area of accrued expenses is probably the most likely to appear. Accrued expenses are expenses that the client incurred this year that they're not going to pay until next year. Examples include loss contingencies, warranty costs, interest on debt, and year-end payroll. So let's start with loss contingencies because there's a lot they can ask you about that. We know under US GAAP, if losses are probable and estimable, losses are booked at year-end. By booked, that means we're going to make a debit to loss on the contingency and credit accrued liability. And that means this journal entry at year end is going to hit both the income statement and the balance sheet. The loss will be an expense on the income statement and then the accrued liability will be on the balance sheet under current liabilities. And this is an entry that companies don't want to make at year end. But if they don't make this entry, what does the auditor say? That expenses are understated, which in turn means net income would be overstated. And if you don't put this liability in, current liabilities would be understated. And as a result, working capital would be overstated. So a proposed journal entry like this, what the exam will do is they'll ask you, well, what happens if this entry wasn't made at year end? And they'll give you some pull down menus asking you what will be the impact on net income? And you'd say net income would be overstated if this entry wasn't made. Why? Because the loss would have increased expenses and expenses would have reduced net income. So failure to recognize this loss would be underreporting expenses and overstating net income. So on the audit exam, if you determine that at year end, this company should have booked a contingent loss for let's say $100,000, but they failed to book the contingent loss, you'd see that you'd be leaving out $100,000 of expense which means expenses would be understated and the income statement would be overstated. Net income would be too high. And then the accrued liability, if you would leave off this $100,000 and fail to book this, you're going to have underreported current liabilities. And as a result, working capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities, would be overstated by 100000 So the analysis part, is what makes this highly likely for a sim. The fact that you have to know what entries should have been made, and then if they weren't made, what would be the impact on the income statement, the balance sheet, and they may go on to say what's the impact on total stockholders equity if you don't make this entry, and you would say that since net income would be overstated by 100,000, retained earnings would be overstated by 100,000, and because retained earnings is overstated, stockholders equity is overstated. And why did we say that this loss has to be booked? 
because if probable and estimable, losses need to be booked at year end. And there's three classifications for contingent losses. You might recall that if it's probable, that means it's likely to occur, then you have to recognize the loss on the income statement and the liability on the balance sheet. But what if it's not probable? What if it's only reasonably possible that this loss is going to occur? That means it's more than remote chance, but less than likely, then just a footnote disclosure is required. You won't make this journal entry if the chances of this loss is only reasonably possible. What if it's only a remote chance that this loss occurs? Then you would ignore it completely. If you get a contingency question, they could mix it into a SIM on journal entries, and you'd have to determine the amount of contingent loss from the facts given. So let's take a look at this. Gemcorp is defending against the lawsuit. They're being sued for 100,000, but estimated a range of losses between 45,000 and 80,000. What does it mean to give a range of losses? Well, attorneys for the company have determined that a loss is probable. That's very important because remember it rose to the level of probable now. As long as it's estimable, we've got to book this contingent loss. So can we estimate the loss? It says there's a range here between 45,000 and 80,000. The independent auditor should look for what amount of loss contingency on the financial statements at year end under U.S. GAAP. So what do we do under U.S. GAAP? Do we book the 100,000 as an estimated contingent loss? No, because the estimated loss is not 100,000. It's a range between 45,000 and 80,000. Now for U.S. GAAP, there's very specific rules as to how to determine what to book for this estimated loss. When there's a range of losses under U.S. GAAP, what do you choose? Do you choose the higher of the two amounts? I mean, that would be a very conservative approach. If we choose the higher amount, the answer would be 80,000 letter C. But 80,000 is not the right amount, is it? No. We're going to book the minimum amount of the range, 45,000 under U.S. GAAP. We book the minimum amount of the range since the loss is probable and a range of losses is estimable. U.S. GAAP says to go ahead and book the minimum amount of the range, not the maximum amount. Why? The maximum would be more conservative, but we're booking the minimum amount in order to avoid having to do what? In order to avoid in the future having to book a gain for the amount of excess estimate. So here's why we would only book a $45,000 loss. Because if 80000 had been booked, and let's say the lawsuit settles next year for 65000 then we would need to book a $15,000 gain to reverse the retained earnings impact of dragging it down by $80,000 first and then only having a $65,000 actual loss. We would need to book a gain of $15,000. So to avoid that problem, we're just going to book the minimum of the range. We'll take the loss of $45,000 onto the income statement. So our journal entry at year end that the auditor is going to look for is this debit to loss on contingency for 45,000 that goes on the income statement and credit liability for contingency for 45,000 that goes on the balance sheet. And of course, they'll ask you if this entry was not made, what would be the impact on net income? And you'd say net income would be overstated by 45,000 and so would retained earnings and so would stockholders equity. And then if this entry wasn't made, current liabilities would be understated by 45,000 and that means working capital would be overstated by 45,000. All right, let's try this one. February 19th, year three, a Duncorp truck was in an accident with an auto driven by Aaron. On January 16th, year four, Dunn received notice of a lawsuit seeking 500,000 in damages for personal injuries suffered by Aaron. So Duncorp's being notified that they're gonna be defending in a lawsuit from that truck accident where their employee injured Aaron. So that's why Dunn received the notice of a lawsuit seeking 500,000 in damages for personal injuries suffered by Aaron. Duncorp's counsel believes it's reasonably possible that Aaron will be awarded an estimated amount in the range between 150,000 and 300,000 and that 220,000 is a better estimate of potential liability than any other amount. Dunn's accounting year ends on December 31st and year three financial statements were issued March 8th of year four and that's important because when they receive notice of this, the financial statements haven't been issued yet. What amount of loss 
should done accrue at December 31st, year three? And I want you to tell me in the comments what you think the answer is. So tell me in the comments or go to cpaexamtutoring.com and get in touch with me here. You could click on the scholarship and then contact us. You can even, while you're here, apply for an I-75 scholarship and possibly get all four parts for free. If you've noticed, I've given away 15 scholarships already in 2020. If you already have access to Becker or some other course, but you want to learn from me, then just go down to the one part, click on the audit course, and I got a couple of really good options for you here. You could buy the full course bundle for 109 per month and get the test bank along with the premium videos, the instructor-led simulations. You get everything for 109 a month. But if you already have a test bank, then scroll down a little bit further and you can get the I-75 skinny subscription for just 79 a month where you'll get all the premium audit videos, which means you'll be learning from the Kingmaker but you won't get the test bank. You won't get the I-75 test bank. That's the only thing you won't get if you get the skinny subscription. But if you already have a test bank, then you're okay. You can save a little money. You can even get 180 days of the skinny course for $199. But if you're serious about passing audit, get yourself on I-75. Take it to your next pass, just like these folks did. And then you can come back and leave me a great recommendation just like these people who came to me and said, hey, Darius, I need you to do for me what you did for so many others. So I put them on I-75, they passed the CPA exam, and they were happy to come back and leave me these incredible tributes.